Father, I thank you, Lord, that you do all things well. And Lord, we want to just lift up just Marcus to you, Lord. Um, we know that you work all things for good to those that love you, Lord. And so I pray that you would just um, hold on Jennifer through this very difficult time so far. Help her to focus on you, Lord, and pray you would just pour out your grace and comfort for her. And we as her sisters can bless her and support her through this and give us wisdom and do that. Um, pray for Marcus, Lord, that you um, just let him draw near to you and you draw near to him and work in his life. Lord, pray for the children and the children and protect them, Lord. cheerful this evening despite the circumstances. Just bless her, Father, and bless her with the children. Bless her with a calm, quiet heart, so that she would be able to even hear you speak to her through the live stream like it tonight, Father. I thank you that you are with her this evening, and I pray, Father, that Marcos would be convicted, Lord, that you would save his soul, and that you would just show him what he looks like, Father. Just help um, Jennifer with being an example of that to him, Lord, and just encourage your heart even when she feels like crying, Lord, just help her eyes smile, or face to feel smiles instead. I pray, Lord, that you would just help her to come to our heart and just bless her, Father. Bless her so richly and just encourage her. Oh uh-huh. 
I chose that song because, in essence, this teaching, it's all about our lives lost in Jesus' life. It's being consecrated and letting Jesus take complete control of our life. And that is, in essence, a healthy self-image. So um, I would like to start off with praying. So let's bow our heads forward our prayer. God, I just thank you for this evening. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. God, I know that it's not my teaching, but it's your teaching, and it's what you have taught me, God. And I just pray that I would, be, with a humble heart, Lord, be just be willing to be bold and speak your words, not my own words, not my ideas, God, but what you want me to share, Father. You are such a good Father, and I thank you that we don't need to struggle, Lord. We can just bring all our trials and our cares, our self-image issues to you, and you can make us whole and beautiful. God, I just thank you that there's nothing more in this world that can make us more beautiful but a relationship with you, and I just thank you. Amen. So why this teaching? Um, I was thinking of 1 Peter 3, and I actually would like to read. If you have your Bible, you can flip there. I think we'll just read the whole chapter. Second, did I say first Peter? I mean second Peter, verse three, starting at verse one. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition, and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some, count, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction." He therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Maybe you're thinking what this has to do with the teaching on self-image, but I want to bring out that <clears throat> um, verse, the verse that says that there shall be scoffers in the last day. And isn't that true? Isn't there scoffers in the last day against beauty, against true beauty and a true self-image? The world is screaming at us on every side, you know, look like this model, look like, be skinny, you're too fat. Um, your nose is, is, is not the way it should be. The world is screaming and telling us that we are not beautiful unless we look like those skinny models. And it's just not true. And I feel that in the last days, Things are going to intensify, and we need to keep, we need to remind, just as Paul says, that he he wanted to stir up the pumites by way of remembrance. I want to do that tonight, and while studying for this, I was very blessed because 
I realized even how I had fallen in that. And then when Maria asked if I would do a teaching on self-image, because we were talking about modesty and, and me and Maria, Maria were both feeling like, you know, not another teaching on modesty. Maria had done a really good job a while ago. And so she asked me, well, what is the root issue? Because I, well, I, I said to her, it's not the root issue. And she, she asked me, well, what is the root issue? What do you think is the root issue? And I said, well, self-image. And then she asked if I would do a teaching on it. And, and I told her, I said, I'm not the one to be doing a teaching on this because I, I said, I struggle myself. I said, lately, I said, I'm not going to do teaching. And I thought, you know what? That was final. I, I thought, good, I got out of this one. I'm so glad because I felt like I was not the one to do this. So I went home <clears throat> and I was so relieved. And then the next day, all of a sudden, all these thoughts came to me, all these thoughts that I, like I, of truth from God's word about true beauty and our self image. And I was like, no, I'm, why are these thoughts coming to me? And I started writing them down. And as time went on, I was like, more things were coming to me, more thoughts. And I was opening up the Bible and I was like, wow, there's so much in here about a healthy self image. So then Maria asked me again, I didn't think she was going to come back. I thought it was final. <laughs> and she came back to me and I was like, yes, I'll do it because I knew the Lord was prompting me. And it was amazing to me because doing the study and praying about it and looking up verses in God's word, his truth, it really did something to me. And I felt like the Lord healed me from an unhealthy self-image because I didn't know how much I had fallen. And I think, well, if I am 41 years old, if I'm struggling, how many girls in here, how many women in here are struggling? And you may not know it. How many of us would believe, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us would actually believe the verse in Psalm 139, verse 14, that says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right, right well. Or what about right at the beginning in Genesis 131? And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Do we believe that? Do we believe that our nose is made the way God wants it to be? Okay, I know I bring up my nose. I have nose because that's what I struggle with, okay? <laughs> so, but did you know that your nose is the way God wanted it to be? Your hair um, your legs, like it's the way God wanted it. So are we content? Um, <clears throat> it's very hard because the world is constantly screaming at us. And I know, and I hope that we're not grabbing those magazines and looking through those magazines that we see in the checkouts, but it is very hard to avoid them. And they're right there. And it's, um, it's hard to, to live in this world and to feel that accepted and that God loves us the way, um, just the way we are. And then another reason why I feel so burdened with this topic is because in my youth, I, I didn't have a proper um, view of self-image. So I, I went to public school all my life and there was this constant pressure to dress like everyone else. And, you know, you had the cool group and the popular group and they dressed just so, and then you had the in-between and then just the losers, right? And I wanted to be with the popular. I wanted guys to notice me and I was chasing security in all the wrong places and it led me down the wrong path. And how it started was my thinking. My, I was thinking wrong thoughts and then it started coming out into my behaviors and it led me to places I shouldn't have been and it led me to do things that I shouldn't have done. Um, so the sad thing is that it didn't improve my self-image. It only made it worse and I had to seek out more and more to get that satisfaction because there was no satisfaction. It was, it was an unending search until the Lord was mer merciful and eventually caught a hold of my heart. I got saved and it just it was like overnight, I didn't have an insecurity issue. My security and identity was in Christ. I was complete in him. I didn't need to now wear makeup or the latest shoes and clothes to feel secure. The thing is, Women love beauty, and as time goes on, we can start, we can get gray hair, and we can start noticing changes, or if we don't keep our relationship with Christ vibrant, we can start slowly and subtly um, believing lies, and that's why um, I want to talk about that too, because I know lately in church, there's been a lot of talk about being deceived and lies, and so this is a huge thing for us women, I believe, not just us women, but for men too, but especially for us ladies. Um, but like I was thinking too, there were scoffers in Noah's day, right? And they were, you know, scoffing, like, where is the water to float your boat? And now this day it's, you know, why are you wearing that thing on your head? Why are you dressed the way you do? Why don't you just dress the way 
you know, those models do or those women on the magazines, that's beautiful. You, you know, like all these things, beauty or self image is being is under attack. So we need to, yeah, we need to do what we can to not follow the world's ways. And so I want to start off by, um, I have a handout here that I, would you hand them out for me, Isabel? So, um, yeah, so if you want to write some notes about the basic teaching is in this handout here. Um, you can, you're welcome to write notes. There's some blank pages on the other side. <clears throat> We're going to start off by going on the definition of what a self-image, what self-image is. So if you turn, I think, the first page, um, I want to go over the history of body image. I found that very fascinating. I remember learning about that even in high school, um, the women's liberation movement and how even clothing changed during that time when women, they wanted to get out in the workforce and be equal with men. And that obviously changed the way they dressed as well, because now they were more bold and out there. And now they need to dress that way too, to keep up with their image, right? Um, so, definition of self-image is the personal view or mental picture that we have of ourselves. It is an internal dictionary that describes the characteristics of the self, including such things as intelligent, beautiful, ugly, talented, selfish, and kind. So, it's not just looks. It's our inward, what we think of ourselves, our personal view of what we think of ourselves. So, do we have a healthy image or an unhealthy image? We're going to talk about um, both. Um, so standards of what is beautiful changes with time. Um, and the world obviously teaches us to focus on our outward, not our inward. Um, but the Bible is always pointing inward to the inner man. That's what's most important. Uh, in Joan Jacobs Brumberg's book called The Body Project, An Intimate History of American Girls, states that before the 1900s, girls were more concerned with their characters than their appearance. She writes that diaries from the 1800s mention girls' struggles to better their behavior, and they were not obsessed with their bodies and perfections. So if you even think of um, books like Little House on the Prairie, and um, I, there's a lot of mention just on manners and just behaviors. Uh, the, but in, in the 1900s, it took a shift, and women started caring more about their physical appearance and not so much on their and less on their characters. Um, I have something I want to read, a screenshot. I had found something online that I thought was very interesting. Now, this was in Texas, but it has affected the whole world. Women in Texas and throughout the country took great strides toward equality in the 20th century. In the early decades that followed, women began abandoning their traditional roles along with the more restricting fashions of the past in search of greater opportunity and more comfortable clothing. While the 19th century woman was expected to restrict her interest to home and family, the new woman of the 20th century worked in an office, sought higher education, and participated in active sports. This contemporary archetype of the American woman was bolder, more active, and more outspoken than her mother's generation, and ready for new options. As women, and this is what's interesting, as women broke away from traditional expectations, fashion reflected her changing place in society, Daywear lost its frills and trimmings and became more tailored, similar to menswear. At the same time, fashion began revealing more of women's bodies. So, yeah, that's a little bit of history. And then, of course, in the 1930s when Hollywood came out, um, yeah, women were on display. And there was, yeah, it just it had, we have even more pressure. And we're all aware when we go into Walmart, we see all the different products there. Um, hair, skin, and nail products are popular in huge companies. It's hard to make decisions. What shampoo, what, what is what? There's just so much out there. I remember even before I was converted, um, I went to a convenience store and it was a vending machine. And it had like stickers, very like stickers of immodest women uh, dressed in bathing suits. And it bothered me. You could pop a quarter in there and get one of these stickers. And I remember I told the, the store guy, I told him, why do you have that here? Because it bothered me. I, I don't know if I was jealous or what, but I'm just like, why do you have this? Why are you selling this? And, and it was interesting what he said. And it's so true. 
He goes, because it sells. It's all about money, right? So one of these days, they're displayed to make money, and it's not... It's, it's a pit and we don't want to fall into that. So we want to avoid it. So that's why we're here to talk about the truth of God's word. Um, but I wonder how many of us women and girls are affected by these lies. Never before do we need the truth and now. But the answer is in the truth of who we truly are in Christ. That's the answer. Only then can we have a proper self-image. So now that we have talked about the history, let's go into the effects of an unhealthy self-image. I think that's on the, yeah. As well, was there any extra or was that, there was not enough. Oh, can we share? Sorry. I went to the library to get them printed off and I was kind of surprised that the cost, I should have a donation box up here, but um, no, I'm just kidding. But it was very, very interesting because the old man, the old gentleman, I thought I could just go and print them off myself. And there was an, there was an older gentleman that he, he had to do it. So he was kind of looking over my paper. I'm just like, oh, he's like, so what are you doing? And, and then I told him, and then we got into discussion about uh, self-image. It was really interesting. And he's like, he's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, Facebook, he's like, I know some of the prettier girls, they get more likes than the, the other girls, and they're probably jealous. And I'm like, well, I'm not really talking about that, but yeah, I guess I could. <laughs> and it was an interesting conversation to have with that old man in the library, but anyway. <clears throat> so the effects of an unhealthy self-image, obviously the most damaging effect is, that, effect is that we believe Satan and we agree with the world. Once we agree with the world, we lose our identity in Christ and we open up ourselves to more lies from the devil. We start focusing more and on fads and fashions and we may even dress more inappropriately. And I was thinking that is often the root cause of immodesty because modesty is closely tied to our worth in Christ. If we are secure in him, we won't need to dress to impress or to wear the latest. Um, we will be secure in Christ. We don't need all that. And this is what I started doing. I did the dressing, and then I also, eventually you start behaving inappropriately to gain attention or the false approval of others. And it's very damaging where that can lead you. And another thing, <clears throat> a big thing, and I don't even know if we've ever as a church talked about this, but I wonder how many of us are in bondage to this, an eating disorder. And I'm very burdened by that because it's not a good place to be in. Um, I remember when I went to high school, there were several girls with this issue. And I was thinking, well, Christians don't struggle with this, right? But you'd be surprised. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about eating disorders, actually, for a big chunk of this teaching. Because it's, I'm burdened about it. It's heavy on my mind. And I want you girls to be free or to not fall into this trap. Just to be aware. Eating disorders are behavioral conditions characterized by severe and persistent disturbance in eating behaviors and associated distressing thoughts and emotions. Two main eating disorders are anorexia and bulimia. <clears throat> so a definition, it's on your paper there, of uh, anorexia is Cleveland, clevelandclinic.org <clears throat> defines anorexia as having an intense fear of gaining weight. Being unable to realistically assess your body weight and shape and having a distorted self-image, <clears throat> having an obsessive interest in food, calories, and dieting, feeling overweight or fat, even if you're underweight. A lot of the supermodels that are out there, <clears throat> they would be classified as anorexia. And I think further on in the notes, I have it here, but I'll just share it now. 80% of them um, deal with an eating disorder, and they have a trainer, and they are meant to follow a certain diet because they can't, they have to stay that certain weight if they want to be on that runway and <clears throat> they have this pressure. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like something I'd want. It's not worth it. And a lot of them lose their periods. They don't even have a period <clears throat> anymore because <clears throat> their calorie intake is so low, their body cannot function properly. <clears throat> All in the name of looking beautiful. The next one is bulimia, an eating disorder characterized by regular, often secretive bouts of overeating, followed by self-induced vomiting or purging. <clears throat> purging just means like using laxatives to get it out of your system. 
strict dieting or extreme exercise associated with persistent and excessive concern with body weight. This usually follows guilt and shame. That's a cycle. And that definition is from Oxford languages. So here are the statistics. Um, statistics tell us that approximately 600,000 to 990,000 Canadians meet the criteria for eating disorders and about 80% are girls or women. On average, girls develop anorexia at 16 or 17. Teen girls between 13 and 19 and young women in the early 20s are most at risk. That's from womenshealth.gov. Starvingsoul.org states, at least 30 million people of all ages and genders suffer from an eating disorder in the United States. Young people ages 15 to 24 with anorexia have 10 times the risk of dying compared to their same age peers. Every 62 minutes, at least one person dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. That's really sad. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Eating disorders are the third most common chronic illness among adolescent females. And this one is the most scary to me. Um, one in five anorexic deaths is by suicide. So what did they gain from it? <clears throat> How do they develop? They develop when we start listening to the lies of society and when we attempt to find security in all the wrong places, not in Jesus Christ. That's how they start. The underlying issue is faulty belief system. Disorder thinking can lead to disordered eating. So if we read Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So belief, belief produces behaviors. To change a behavior, we must change the belief. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 4.23. So this is why I made this diagram here, just to give us a picture. So we've probably read these, this on a poster or bookmarks. This is not my original. This is, But it is from the Bible. It's biblical, because what you believe determines what you think. What you think determines how you feel. What you feel determines what you do, which is behavior. Right? So what are, what are we doing? So this is just the scriptures I just read that. Um, so as a man thinks, so is he. And keep the heart with all diligence. So that's basically in a nutshell what that means. So are we believing the truth? Like are we, um, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5 says, casting down imaginations and taking our thoughts captive. If we are doing that, and if we are thinking on things that are lovely, true, and of good report, then we will believe the truth and we will have a healthy self-image. Who is the author of a healthy self-image? Jesus Christ. What does it lead to? Security, satisfaction, and joy. Because our worth is in Jesus Christ. But now if you go here on the other side, and we are not doing what 2 Corinthians and Philippians 4 tells us to do, we start believing lies. And we may think we're ugly, worthless, fat, dumb, and there's many others. And we start, we have an unhealthy self-image. Who's the author of that? It's Satan. It leads to insecurity, dissatisfaction, lack of joy, and our worth is in our physical appearance, which changes as we get older. So scary. Is it any wonder why um, the women out in the world, they need to do all these surgeries and to keep looking good. We don't need to be under that pressure. <clears throat> In the same way that the Bible tells us that man reaps what he sows, in the same way what a man thinks, um, so he will be. I used to think it didn't matter so much because, you know, our thoughts are our thoughts, right? No one can see them. It doesn't matter. But you know what? It does matter. The Bible says so. Eventually, they will come out in our behaviors, and we'll, we're going to be like, well, how did this start? Well, check your thoughts. And I find, too, that we tend to focus a lot on behaviors, but not on what's driving these behaviors. I think it's not just with self-image. If we look at many things in life, you know, why a person is a certain way or, you know, even I was thinking with Marcus Penner, you know, it makes you wonder what, what has happened to him? What, what happened? That <clears throat> but back to eating disorders. Um, the mainstream doctors tell us that eating disorders are a disease, but it's not true. If we believe that eating disorders are a disease, that leaves us with no responsibility because oh, it's a disease. And I know that people that have gone to doctors, the doctor will tell them, 
yeah, you know, you have an eating disorder, it's a struggle, but you're just going to be left with it now because you're always going to struggle with it because it's a disease, but it's not true. Um, instead, according to, and I looked this up and I found it quite interesting, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she's a cognitive neuroscientist with over 25 years of brain research, and she says an eating disorder is not a disease, it is a disorder of the mind. And I thought that was very interesting. If it's a disorder of the mind, which I believe it is, then we can change that because we need to just change our mind. So again, what you believe determines what you think. What you think determines how you feel. What you feel determines what you do. So scripture and neuroscientists, neuroscience, they tell us that we can change the way we think. It's very powerful. Dr. Leaf goes on to say that eating disorders are caused by disordered thinking which may be caused by an understandable human and indeed normal response to traumatic or distressing circumstances. <clears throat> now, I don't want to promote uh, psychology, but it does affect things in our life do affect us, um, but we don't need to stay there. We can move on with God. Um, but when we fail to keep vigilant watch, this is by Leslie Ludy here from the book, The Lost Art of True Beauty. When we fail to keep vigilant watch over our soul and carelessly expose our hearts and minds to the message of modern culture, we become vulnerable to making ungodly choices. This is the first step to an eating disorder. And I was thinking, it's not God's will for us to be so consumed with our, um, with what we eat and what we wear. Luke 12, 22 to 23 says, and he said unto his disciples, therefore I say unto to you, take no thought for your life of what you shall eat or what you shall put on, neither for the body, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. So, and I was thinking too, that eating disorders, they probably they make a person probably feel like their life is out of control. So when they have an eating disorder, it's like they they feel like they can control something, but it's false. It's not true. They can't. They just think, well, now they feel like their life is out of control. So they think, well, I, you know, just kind of watch what I eat. So back to, um, so now I'm going to talk about stressors that may spark the onset of eating disorders. And again, this is from Dr. Carolyn Leaf's work. Um, needs difficulty in managing emotions, low self-esteem, dieting, rejection, abandonment, need for control, anxiety, desire for perfection, and childhood trauma. Uh, most of us have experienced some kind of trauma or disappointments in life. But, you know, it's what we do with them. Um, because if we, if we don't give them to Christ as our healer, they will set us back. Um, and then add to that the pressure that we get in culture today and social media, it really affects us to be discontent in the way God made us. So how do we deal with the traumas and the experiences in our life? Well, identify the trauma, identify and admit the hurts that you faced in life, but don't let them define who you are in Christ. Give it to Jesus. And, you know, if you need help, it's, I think, you know, we are sisters. We need each other. Go to someone that you trust and share it with them. I'm sure they'll pray for you and help you out. But if we don't do these things, um, Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, I don't want to do any modern psychology stuff here. It's not what I'm saying, but the experiences do shape us. I know I, I've had traumatic experiences in my life, and I've never wanted them to define me, but I know they easily could have. Um, there's healing in Jesus, and we want, he heals the broken in heart and bindeth up the wounds, Psalm 147, verse 3. And another thing is that a lot of the images on magazines, they're not even real. I'm sure most of you know that. With today's technology and all the airbrushing and editing they do, I've even read that they will even take certain parts of a woman and put it on a picture, and then they'll take another woman's different parts and put it on the picture and there you go you got the perfect woman and I just think wow that's bizarre when I was researching this I read that, that and I was like whoa that's in here you know a lot of these people are doing anything they can to try to look like these models 
yeah, it's it's a lie. <clears throat> so Leslie Ludy writes in The Lost Art of True Beauty, when we begin adopting a careless attitude toward the influences of pop culture, participating in its messages and taking its advice, we take the first step down the road to an eating disorder. The moment temptation comes and we hear the subtle whisper of the enemy in our ear saying, you would be so much prettier if you were as skinny and as, rath -like most, as that wrath-like supermodel on the cover of that magazine. We have a choice to make. We can either listen to his voice and entertain his suggestions, or we can immediately choose to tune out the lies and respond with truth. My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I will not look to pop culture standards to define my security, but to Jesus Christ and the purchase of his cross. So if God has been speaking to you in the area of an eating disorder, go to someone. Go to God, first of all, um, because it needs to be repented of, but Jesus' power can change and set you free. The enemy, of course, always wants us to stay quiet and not share with anyone. <clears throat> Don't do it. Don't listen to his lie. Now, on a positive note, what is a healthy self-image? Um, well, the first step that we already talked about is to recognize the lies in our beliefs and then to surrender those false views and ideals that are not biblical. We need to first admit that. If we've been believing lies, we need to admit that, but we need to change our beliefs. So I'm just going to ask you, I know I have some in the notes here, but can you think of any others? What are some beliefs we could have that need to be surrendered to God? Some wrong beliefs. Um, I know for me, back then, it used to be I craved a male attention <laughs> before I was saved. And I thought that as long as I had a boyfriend, then I was desirable and I had a good self-image as long as a guy liked me. But if he didn't or if I didn't have a boyfriend, then I was worthless. So that was wrong thinking. Can, uh, does anyone have any other beliefs that could be wrong? That's not biblical. Yes. Why do you want to always? Um, <laughs> I want to be like. Um, I can't say. <laughs> Everyone to agree with you or? With, to be on everybody's good side. Okay, so be like a man pleaser, almost. A, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. <clears throat> Anyone else think of anything, Nelly? I feel like a lot of times, especially in the younger girls, but even in the older women, we could feel this way, that we're more slim, our clothes will fit us better, and we'll look nicer, and people will like us more. Because sometimes the more outgoing person is nice and slim and dresses nice, and they're outgoing, and then you see all these girls kind of oh. walk to that person, mm -hmm. and look up to that person, so they feel the pressure that if they looked like that, mm -hmm. then they would be liked as well. You know what? That's very true. Isn't that kind of sad, though? <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Sometimes I think it's not, not necessarily um, the the what our body is like, but we can put more emphasis on our clothes. Mm -hmm. if we would dress like so and so, or if we did our hair like so and so, or our head covering was like that. We wore the shoes that they did. If we could be as cool as them, like if we could dress like them, then mm -hmm. popular. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. Is there anything else? Okay, yeah. So I was thinking then if we have disorder thinking um, or if we've believed lies about our self-image, then it would make sense to correct the wrong thinking. We need to realign our thoughts. We need to think God's word, which is the truth. So that... Brings me back to that scripture that I have up there, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. We'll just read it here. For the weapons of our warf warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that it's exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so once, yeah, once we have done that, we've recognized the lies and, and we, um, yeah, we, cast it down wrong thoughts. Then Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, because now we have to replace it, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So we must, number one, renew our minds, Romans 12, 2. 
and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renew renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is this that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to take our thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians 10.5, I read that already, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And then after that, we need to think on things above. Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. But we also need to choose joy. James 1, 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. <clears throat> but we also need to be alert and resist the devil. That's Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And lastly, put on the whole armor of God and stand fast. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. <clears throat> so that we have a part to do. So it's not like the doctor... A woman, a girl with an eating disorder comes to the doctor and the doctor just says, well, it's a disease. You have to live with it. I'll give you some pills. I'll help you with whatever. But you know what? We have a part to do. And that's thinking right thoughts. That's, you know, casting down wrong thoughts and being on the alert and being God's word. God's truth on cultivating true beauty. What is true beauty? I like what Leslie Ludi says here. True feminine beauty is exchanging all that we have for all that he is. That's it in one sentence. Or, yeah. True feminine beauty is exchanging all that we have for all that he is. I just love that. I just had to put it in bold because I just love it. Um, and how does this play out in our day today? Number one, a vibrant relationship with Jesus because that's where a healthy image starts. It's outside of Jesus Christ. It's not possible um, because it it's just... There's too much pressure out there. You know, we have social media now. There's the internet. And it's not that those, of course, those things are wrong. We just had a, um, Ben Bergen did a teaching on that a little while ago. Those things aren't wrong. But they do, I know they do affect us to some degree. And so that's why I say protect your relationship with Jesus. Don't waste your time on social media. And because overuse of the internet can make us discontent <clears throat> and it can weaken our faith. Because outward beauty is an expression of the transformation Christ has made to our inner life. So here again, it's our inner life. When God's spirit is given his rightful place in a woman's life, he transforms her personality to, refer, to reflect his beauty, his grace, and his selflessness. I love that because you can have any personality, whether it be like what Nellie was sharing, the outgoing girls seem to always be popular. And, you know, you can have a reserved personality, a shy personality, or an outgoing personality, or both personality but jesus when he takes a hold of your heart he can use your personality to, to reflect his beauty and his glory and his grace and i just love that but it needs to be surrendered to god because god made the different personalities he made us diverse he made us all shapes and sizes but he, he loves each one and if we allow him to transform our life he can make us beautiful and i use the term here ageless beauty but I don't really believe in ageless beauty. But I do think if we are beautiful inside, we will have ageless beauty. Um, not the fake fountain of youth. But do we want that? Do we want the fountain of youth? Not the, the kind that the world is chasing after, but our inner man. Do we want that beautified? Well, you know what? It's soaking ourselves in the Bible and having a close walk with Jesus, a real relationship with Jesus, where we keep our conscience clear and we desire to go closer to him. Um, I want to, I don't have it in the notes here. I wrote it in mine. I just added it because I thought of Proverbs 15, 13. So if you want, you can turn there. <clears throat> a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So a woman that is cheerful she, what she's inside will show on her face, right? So, and that's what struck me is that a merry heart is, it makes a cheerful countenance. It makes a cheerful, countenance means like appearance. So it makes a cheerful appearance. Doesn't that look better than the made up fake, bright red lipstick, um, fake eyelashes? Um, isn't that better? Like, yeah, you, you don't, 
need to go out and do all these external things. But I know that it takes a heart that is surrendered to God, though, and we need to empty ourselves of all the worldly thoughts and beliefs that we have. But and it says here, but the sorrow of the heart, but by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I wonder actually how happy those models are. Makes me think without all that makeup and external things that they do, I wonder how actually they would look if we would think that looks beautiful after all. <clears throat> I wonder sometimes. And Psalm 42, verse 11, talks in that, that verse as well about the countenance. And like I said, countenance just basically means appearance. So Psalm 42, verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So who is the health of our countenance? It's God. And hope in God. Praise him. And he, he is the health of our countenance. So... I was just very blessed by those verses because the women of the world, they always need to keep up with the latest trends. And it must, I would just think, you know, it must be extremely difficult to just be every day thinking, okay, now I need to go do my routine so I can stay in shape. And, and I'm not saying those things are wrong, but you know what I mean? All in the name of like the way they restrict themselves and the things they need to do to stay on camera, that pressure must be, I, I don't think they can be happy. <clears throat> So, yeah, in the notes here, I have that the godly beauty doesn't come from spending hours online. It comes from secret time with Jesus in your closet. That's true beauty right there. No one can take that beauty from you. Um, this is Proverbs 31.30. Beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And like manner also, I just see a typo there, but that's okay. And like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Good works is beautiful. First Timothy 2, 9 to 10. So we talked about if we want that true beauty, a healthy self-image, we need a vibrant relationship with Jesus. Now, number two, we need to deny ourselves. Well, that's weird. That's totally against what the world always tells us. You know, we need to throw ourselves out there and be somebody, be bold. But that's not what Jesus teaches. And this is verse, Mark 8, verses 34 to 36. And when he called, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall a profit a woman if she shall gain the whole world in its beauty and lose her own soul? I feel like that's what a lot of the women are doing out there. They're losing their own, own soul just for, in the name of beauty and having the camera on them all the time. So in that verse, do not literally translate to, one, to, to forget oneself in one's own interests. Isn't that interesting how that can give us a healthy self-image? But it does because it's what Jesus, um, he showed us how to do that. He, um, he's our pattern, right? We need to follow his pattern. So according to those verses, the key to female insecurity is denying ourselves and to live a selfless life for Jesus, taking up a cross with our own desires and wants and ideas and following Jesus. It reminds me of in John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. So it's not about fixing our self-esteem. In other words, it's not about esteeming self. It's about denying self. Because it's to point people to Christ, not to ourselves. Leslie Ludy calls it a selfless beauty. And she defines it as those who have exchanged a self-focused life for a Christ-focused one. Instead of self-confidence, they radiate Christ-confidence. I just love that, Christ-confidence. That, in a nutshell, is a healthy self-image. It's portraying the image of God. We dress and act to reflect the joy and radiance that fills our soul. So instead of doing all those things to be popular and noticed, be selfless, gracious, and Christ-like to those around us. That's true beauty. So we looked at... <clears throat> To cultivate true beauty, we need to deny ourselves. We need to have a vibrant relationship with Jesus. And number three is 
a meek and quiet spirit. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 3 to 4 tells us, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So there it says that a meek and quiet spirit is an ornament, and Oxford Languages actually says that um, an ornament is something used to make something look more attractive. So you want to look more attractive? Practice a meek and quiet spirit. That is beautiful to God. And I know the world doesn't understand that. <clears throat> but beautifying our outside only fades with time. Inner beauty with the heart at rest with Christ never fades. Psalm 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. <clears throat> so, yeah, the meek and quiet spirit. A woman who has a meek and quiet, quiet spirit, she's gracious peaceful, serene, and quietly dignified. She is content and secure in her relationship with her king. But have you ever seen an older woman who's, who just seems so beautiful, even though she has wrinkles and gray hair? I've seen it before. And what is it that attracted us to her? Was it her figure? Um, was it her good looks? No, it was her, just her godliness that shone through to her face. Her face was beautiful because she... She possessed this inner quiet confidence in the Lord. That's how I want to be when I'm older. I have a long way to go, but it just really blessed me because I was like, wow, it's so easy to forget these things. But it's so simple. It's in God's word. And like I said, it's a relief to not go after the world's standard of beauty. It's actually very relieving because God's beauty in a woman deepens over time, whereas the world's beauty, false beauty, it doesn't deepen in time. A woman has to keep going, doing more to stay in shape. And and I know a lot of those models and women out there, they will restrict um, themselves like to have children because it changes their figure. And they have to do all these things, but we don't need to be part of that. We may feel tempted by the thought that modesty hides her beauty, but Proverbs, and here I noticed I made a mistake here. <laughs> it's interesting because I wrote Proverbs um, 30, 31. And then when I looked that up, it was something about a greyhound and a, it's like, <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, now I have to fix that. And how many pages I have here? I'm like, so you can do that yourself. <laughs> but it's 3130. It's the same verse I already um, quoted. <clears throat> so anyway, um, we may be, we may feel, we may feel tempted that modesty hides our beauty, but it, it does because popularity and beauty are worthless. So we looked at the meek and quiet spirit. If we cultivate, uh, how to cultivate true beauty, meek and quiet spirit, denying ourselves and having a vibrant relationship with Jesus. Number four is our identity is in Christ and how he made us. Our value comes from knowing we have been redeemed by the King of Kings and we have a relationship with him. Our focus is on him and not our own desires. If we, are see, if we see ourselves the way God does and we are secure in him, it frees us to be who he created us to be. We don't need to try to please other people or try to be popular like what Esther said to dress in a certain way because, you know, it's popular. We don't need, we need, we don't need that because we are secure in Christ. And another comforting thing is that Jesus doesn't hold us to an impossible standard the way the world does. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we should want to honor Jesus with our appearance. But there's another side to it as well. And that's to not be sloppy and careless. Because if um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we are, our body is the temple of God, temple of the Holy Ghost, and we need to take care of it. So what are some ways, healthy ways, that we can take care of our bodies? Any ideas? I know I have some here, so maybe. But I was just wondering if anyone else had a, you know, the way I have exercise, eating right, relaxation. I don't know, can you think of others? Susie? Oh, that's a good one. You proper sleep, she says. Yes, proper sleep. That's taking care of our temple. That's actually a good. One. I'm surprised I didn't think about that one. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Any others? 
Maria? Keeping ourselves clean. Yeah. Regular shower, wash our hair. That's right. These basic things, right? But because you can go to the one ditch we were talking about, you know, all the vain beauty and glamour and all that. But there can be the other side where we're just careless. Um, that's not the way Christ was. <clears throat> So I am going to talk now about weight issues, and I didn't know if I should because some of you might think, well, how do you know what it's like, right? But did you know that most people that have anorexia are super skinny, and they're the ones that struggle the most with their weight? That statistics have shown that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I know for some it's an issue of overweight, and for others it's underweight. But I know that restricting ourselves we need to be careful with that because like i said um we you know how we need to look at underlying issues well i was thinking too with our weight so if we really feel like we need to lose weight first of all let's find out maybe find out first um what the underlying issue is because is it a medical issue is it a hormonal issue um is it because you're prone to eating when you're stressed? Because once you know the root cause of your weight issue, it's easier to fix because now if you restrict your diet and it's, you have a medical condition or, or it's something else, it's not going to give you lasting results. And <clears throat> a diet could just turn into a, an eating disorder. So it's better to know the root issue. And if you need help, if you're unsure and you need someone to talk to, find someone that you trust to see if they can help you out with that. But go to Jesus, first of all. I always say that because Jesus has all the answers for us. And another thing I wish I would have known when I was a teenager is that for the younger girls, is that your hormones are changing. I'm sure most of you know that. And sometimes you gain weight during that time because your body is preparing to one day have a baby, right? So it's releasing all these hormones. And so sometimes your weight will kind of just go kind of like yo-yo. And it can be alarming because you're like, oh, what's going on? And like, how far is this going to go? And so girls at that age, I think that's why they're so at risk of developing an eating disorder because they're afraid they're going to get fat. And, but I was thinking too, you can go to the extreme and if you restrict your calories at that time, you could end up losing your period. I know I've heard it before that you can actually, you, if for women that don't have, for girls that don't have the period yet, you could actually um, postpone your period or if you have a period you could actually make the period stop and it's not good because your body needs carbohydrates proteins and fats for a healthy hormonal system you can actually mess up your hormones at a young age if you now go restrict your diet so much that you're not getting the proper nutrition I wish I would have known that back then <clears throat> but it's I think it's yeah if you do research on it it's it's out there doctors even know that and so if you do give, give yourself proper nourishment, you will have happier hormones. You will feel happier. <clears throat> First Corinthians 9.27 says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, I don't mean that in regards to we need to restrict ourselves now from what I just said now not to do. But what I mean there is to take care of our body so if we are prone to overeating um, because we're stressed or whatever, or we've just made habits. It's good to um, to remember that we should do as Paul did to have some kind of self control because we are called to to have self control, right? but to not go to the other extreme and you know that you're not overweight and you know you don't have issues, but you're afraid. You have this consuming thoughts that you are. I want to turn to 1 John 2, 15 to 17. I'm almost done here. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For all that he, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust and the beauty thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So if we want to cultivate that a healthy self-image and to have true beauty, 
We don't want to love the things that are in the world because isn't um, following the world's desires and that, isn't that the love of the world? And isn't that the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life? So I just wanted to bring that scripture out too, that let's not be lovers of the world and the things and the glamour that's in the world, but let's be lovers of God. I was thinking too, another thought that had come to me with this is that salvation isn't complicated. Jesus has made everything possible for us to be saved. He didn't make it complicated. We complicate things. And I think in the same way he has made self-image, he has made us beautiful the way he wanted us. We complicate things because we're discontent. We're not doing as he told us to do. We complicated things. The world is the one that complicates it. <clears throat> Another thing I have here for the moms is that, you know, we need to raise daughters that are secure in their worth in Christ. And so we be careful how we dress them when they're little as well, because we can actually put it in them from a young age. Oh, this is pretty. Or you have to dress this way because this is cute. Now, I know there is, I'm not saying to completely throw that out, but I'm just saying to be careful because... It will affect them when they're older. And we aren't called to be cute, fashionable. We are called to be holy. So just be careful with that. <clears throat> and isn't it refreshing to see a woman being not being consumed with self, who's so in love with the Lord, having a confidence in the Lord, and wants his desires, and not the desires of the world? Her all-consuming passion is Jesus. I want to be like that. And I know all of you sisters want to be like that. That doesn't change with age or gray hair or wrinkles. It actually deepens in time because it's a lasting beauty. <clears throat> so Jesus has given us everything. We need to have a healthy self-image. We just need to believe his word. We are called to a close relationship with Jesus, to live a selfless life, to have a meek and quiet spirit, and to see ourselves the way the Lord does. If we do these things, we're going to, we're not going to be deceived as easily. I know we've been talking a lot in church about being deceived because we are complete in Christ. True security and beauty comes from the beholding the spotless name of God, not the passing trinkets and false glamour of this world. The women that hold to the world's standard and false view of beauty may therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been drowning therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man or the world spoil you through philosophy and vain beauty and its deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ and his beauty, for in him dwelleth all the head bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power and a healthy self-image. I was like, wow. So I, I was healed through my own teaching. You know, it's God's teaching. But I was like, whoa. Because, I, have, you know, we can easily forget these things. Because when Satan deceives us, like what, we, what we've been hearing lately is in we don't know, right? So... I have, I made this list of 10 things of who I am in Christ. There's many, many more. And I would encourage you, sister, thinking that maybe we could go through the list and then I'll be done here. And who could read number one and then tell me what that verse means to them or how it speaks to them or encourages them or how it helps them with the healthy self-image or whatever you want to share on it. Is there somebody that would like to read? Maybe we need it for that since it's being recorded. Is there someone that would like to read number one? I was thinking because if we verbalize these things, doesn't it make it more real if we read them and we um, verbalize it? Like, I think it does. It does something. Anybody want to do number one? I am loved for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life John 3 16 that verse means a lot to me because no matter what I have done or even where I have come from and the mistakes I've made and where the times I was not seeking my security in him he calls me back to him and he loves me so much. So that's why that verse means a lot to me. Uh, number two, is there someone that wants to read number two? 
Okay, Elizabeth. In whom we have redemption. Okay, it says, I am forgiven. Yep, now she's going to read the verse for it. I am forgiven in, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. Can you tell us why that verse, did that verse, um, what it means to you? Could you tell us what that verse means to you? Or Oh, it means a lot to me because I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I'm... Amen. That's right. See, now she Much more, but they cannot see it all. <laughs> Three, I am chosen. Who wants to read that one? Sure. <clears throat> I am chosen according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. Ephesians 1 verse 4 but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light 1 Peter 2 verse 9 um, when I look at just that, I am chosen, and then it says uh, that we are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That says to me that he chose me um, before I had done anything good, before I had done anything bad, before I was even before I even existed. Like he had chosen to give me the opportunity to come to him, and that just says to me that God looks upon me outside of my performance. Mm -hmm. I am chosen not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is. Because if he was going to choose me according to my responses in life and according to how I behave, I'd be sunk. Mm -hmm. I would be in a terrible place. But he chose me before I even had done anything, either good or bad. He chose me. And that's extremely comforting, yes. very encouraging. Amen. Number four, I am healed and whole. Is there somebody that wants to read that one? I'll do that one. Okay, thanks, Judy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Who in his own self bear his sins, who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. First Peter two verse twenty four. And I think often when we look at those verses, we think Jesus died to heal us spiritually, he died to save us. But we don't grasp the whole thing. Um I always get nervous when I'm talking about this kind of stuff. But um he died to heal us from depression. Mm -hmm. He died to heal us from our anxiety. He died to heal us from our health issues. He died to heal us from fear of man. He died to heal us from any struggle that we have in our lives. Mm -hmm. He died to set us free. And that really means a lot to me because he's done so much for me. It's not like a one-time deal, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, that's a blessing. Susie was going to do number, oh, number five. Can I cheat a little bit? Sure. I actually, um, I would have chosen number three. Okay. I am chosen. No, don't be with me. Um, so can I do number three too? Yes, you can. <laughs> and then I'll let someone else do number five. You need to hear it more than once. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to read it again? Or just? Well, it's up to you. I'm going to read one verse four because that's the verse that um, specifically stood out to me. Okay, Accepted, or sorry, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Um, I was recently reading through the book of Ephesians, and I was just so thoroughly blessed um, what Christ has made me. Um, he chose me. And for me, that, that puts such a liberty on me, like, um, he chose me. So, like, I didn't choose him. He chose me. And just the peace in that, like, it, 
it had I had to think of it like this. Uh, I was driving down the road one day and I was just thinking about my husband and just how he chose me and just to rest in that like I didn't force myself upon him hey choose me you know he chose me and he's satisfied with me like he chose me and just the peace that it brings and I just thought about whoa that's just like in Ephesians here the Lord chose me I didn't have to push myself on him like he wanted me he chose me to be his very own and um yeah just been so blessed by that so I'll leave number five to someone else. He shows me too. I was not a mistake. That's right, Amen. Elizabeth. You're not a mistake. <laughs> <clears throat> had you told me you had one to number three? Is that what you originally said? Okay, I wasn't sure. Okay. Is there anybody that would like to do number five? I can do number five. I don't mind. I'm accepted in the beloved, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 5 to 6. And I, I guess it ties into the, the chosen one as well, that no matter what we do, um, no matter what we go through, we are accepted. We are accepted in him because of what he has done. And it's such an amazing truth. I'm just so thankful for that. Is there someone that would like to do number six, Margaret? Sure. And an another thing that blesses me about number five, about being accepted in the beloved, is that because of who, who Jesus is, um, I'm accepted also in his body, like in the church. Mm -hmm. I'm accepted because of who, what Jesus has done and who he is. I am a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creator. All the things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17. So, you know, thank the Lord. I'm a new person. Before that, before I got saved, I lived in the world. I lived in the world. I pleased men. Um, and so when I got saved, God totally changed me to a new person. And from there, I just have been living for Christ. Um, you know, was it always easy? Like uh, from the beginning, like our Christian walk with him? No, but when I look back, I, I see how much I have grown and how much I, you know, know God's word more and having a closer relationship with him. So yeah, so that word really speaks to me because he's made me a new person and he also chose me. And so my old life, my past is gone. It's behind. And I'm a new person that he created me. And now that I'm living uh, for the Lord, not for the world, not in the world, but for Christ. Amen. Someone that wants to do number seven, I am not condemned. Number seven, I am not condemned. There, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 1. Um, I guess for me, it's more like a personal testimony because I was really struggling with condemnation a while ago. And I remember I was, I was just like, I just felt really dumb, I guess. Like, I just, I'm just bad. Like, nothing good can come out of me. But then I read that. And God really spoke to me. And now whenever I have those feelings, I just say, there is there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus. I've been bought by his blood. And therefore the devil has no power over me. He cannot um, put condemnation on me. So I guess for me, it's just, I really like that verse because it's a big blessing to me. Thanks for sharing that. You're replacing wrong thoughts with truth. That's good, Caitlin. <clears throat> uh, someone that wants to do number eight, I am more than a conqueror. Sure, Esther. I am more than a conqueror. 
Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4, 13. Um, I guess for me, self-image hasn't, in a lot of ways, hasn't so much been my struggle. I've had other struggles in other areas that have, um, I guess, been so overpowering that I didn't, yeah, I guess that was enough to keep me defeated and I didn't struggle as much with self-image. Um, but for me, like this and I am not condemned kind of go together. Um, because often when I'm not a conqueror and I have failed and I am defeated and I'm flat on my face, um, I feel condemned. I feel like there's no hope for me. Like, how can I ever get out of this? And just to have that reality that there is no condemnation. I don't have to be condemned because I never will be. Like, what's the point of trying? There's no hope. I'm always just going to be defeated. I'm just going to fail. But it says so clearly, I can do all things Christ. And that really is the key. And that that's really what speaks to me is that I'm not a conqueror through myself. And if I keep trying to conquer in my own strength, I'm not going to make it. But if I really take that, that through Christ, who strengthens me, I am more than a conqueror. Because, yeah, like, so many of these just tie together. Because, because I'm chosen by him, because I am accepted in him, because I am loved, because he wants me and he chose me, that's what gives me the strength. That's what gives me the power to be able to say that I am a conqueror through Christ. That's right. Thanks for sharing that. How about I am God's workmanship? I can look. I am God's workmanship, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained before, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Um, I was just blessed by the thought of thinking that God made me the way he wants me to be, the way he wants me to look. And I've often been insecure about my looks, thinking that I'm fat and all those kind of things. And it's something I still haven't overcome, especially now that I'm putting on a lot of weight. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just so good to know that like, God made me. And this is what he wanted me to look like, that he thought I was beautiful this way. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it's a comfort for me and that he made me for to do good works, not to be all about me and how I look and all about myself. Exactly. Thanks for sharing that. Last one, I am victorious. Is there some? Judy? Sure. When I look at this one here on number nine, I think of before I became a Christian, the self-image. And I just said, all oh, those plain people, they just look so ugly. They're not beautiful. Oh, I'm not going to put my hair back. I'm going to keep my bangs out or whatever, you know. But it's amazing what God does mm -hmm. when we are new, then we want to be like him. And so he puts in our hearts. I, I said I would never wear a covering. Well, don't ever say never because you might just do something different if God speaks. <laughs> so never is a big word. But anyways, I would never put my bangs back. I started wearing the covering, but I still had to have my beauty out. At least I thought so. Anyways, then didn't take long and my bangs went back. Oh, I got these headaches. Such terrible headaches. My hair wasn't being used well, being putting back. Your bangs, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, it was the direction of my hair. It wasn't used to going back. So <laughs> anyways, I had a good friend and she just said, don't worry, your headaches will go away. That's just Satan's work. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to do God's will. And sure enough, and I'll share who it was. It was Ben Bergen's wife mm -hmm. <laughs> many, many, many years ago. Anyways, the beauty is the inner part mm -hmm. because that's when I saw the real beauty and then I decided to become ugly on the outside sort of speak, sort of to speak in the image of the world the we are ugly to them and we don't want to be beauty to them except for the inner beauty which we want them to find and see in our mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. in our attitudes in our cheerfulness mm -hmm. and yeah I just thank the Lord for working in my heart and yeah. giving that inner beauty and I want to continue to grow on it. You just made me think of 
Proverbs 11.22. <clears throat> because, yeah, the world doesn't see that as beautiful, right? We look, what well, you said, ugly, right? But Proverbs 11.22 says, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. So a lot of those um, women that are in Hollywood or on movies or whatever, you hear of the, like, I don't follow, but I just remember even back in the day, um, the divorce rates. So they may look beautiful on the outside, but they couldn't stay together. <laughs> so there has to be, yeah, something that's not right. So uh, the last one, I am victorious. Bethany? I am victorious, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. I always think it's such a beautiful, um, it creates inner beauty when we're victorious. And I think it's a sweet smelling savor in the Lord's eyes when we can live a victorious life and live above the things that there's so many voices and so many lies that the devil tries to tell us. And if we can truly live above that and live a victorious life. I think it's it's a beautiful thing, and I just hope and pray that, you know, that the outward or the people around us, I guess the world around us, they might think we're ugly, we look awful, and we're in bondage, dressing like this, and whatever they think, but be with us very long before they realize that we have inner beauty, you know, this, this, um, yeah, that just this quiet acceptance of who we are in Christ, and that they can see that peace and that joy in our lives, and I think a good gauge to go by that to see if we are victorious is the fruits of the Spirit, if they're evident in our lives. Love and joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness. Um, there's so many things, you know, that we can shine. We can live above. And, yeah, I just want the beauty of Jesus to be seen in me. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so the reason why I um, decided to do this handout here, Who I Am in Christ, is if we dwell on these things and we seek these things out in God's word, it will help us to have a proper view of the way the Lord sees us. And we don't need to be so caught up with an unhealthy image in the world's way. So that was my desire. And never before have I done such a teaching where I felt so attacked by the devil. And I, many times I wanted to get out of it. And I was like, what's going on? But I just felt so... I was living this topic, though, at the same time, so I knew that there was a war going on. Like, even um, when we were sitting down at the table to eat, I would, everything that came out of my mouth was a <laughs> healthy image, and the children were like, wow, wow, she's always just talking about a healthy image. And so I knew that it was a burden I had, but at the same time, I knew Satan was trying to attack it because this is against, this, Satan doesn't want us to know this because if we don't know God's truth, that's the first step to, going down his way and satan wants that so that's why i think there's such a direct attack on um god's truth in general so yeah thank you for whoever was praying for me i really appreciate that i could feel it so the devil didn't win so thank you may the lord bless you um does someone want to close in prayer thanks maria Lord Jesus, we are just so thankful. Our hearts are full, and we're just so thankful for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done and how beautiful you are. Thank you for the way that you've created us. And I'm just so thankful, God, all these things that you've done in us, that you have provided for us, you've chosen us, you've forgiven us, you've cleansed us, you've washed us, you've made us accepted. You've given us victory, Lord, all these beautiful things. Father, we're seated with you in heavenly places. Help us to remember that. Oh, but not forget the good things that you have done for us. Help us to remember to be thankful in everything and to praise your name and to worship you as we go home. Father, I pray that each one of us would be at rest and at peace in our hearts. We would not be overwhelmed in any way, but we would give all our cares to you all our stresses, our anxieties, we would give them all to you. I pray that each one would walk in the grace of God, that we would 
walk close to you. We would love you with all of our heart. I pray for Sarah that you would bless her for all the studies she did and all the effort she put into it. And I pray protection over her, Father, that the enemy would not come in and discourage her and throw doubts in her mind with what she shared this evening. But I pray that you would or that you would comfort her and that you would protect her and keep her in your care. Father, bless each one as we go home. Keep us safe as we are on the roads. Thank you for the beautiful weather outside, the thunder. Thank you for the way that you speak to our hearts through your word and all through You are very good to us, Father, and we just commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Oh, and another thing, if there's someone that didn't get a copy of uh, the handout, and if they would like one, you can just come to me after, and then I can um, try to remember by Sunday to bring you a copy, because I can just easily make more. So just let me know. Thank you.